Yes, going live. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, Hi. hello. Thank you yeah, hello. so much. Thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to Building an Ecosystem for Social Innovation, Inspiration from Global Models panel. Uh, this panel will be in English. So, marhaba jami'an. Shukran l'adhimamkum l'hai al-jalsa. Bina manzuma riyadiya l'ibtikar al-mujtama'i. Ilham l'madaj alamiya. Al-jalsa l'ha t'koon bil الإنجليزية، so إذا احتجتم للترجمة رجاء أن تتبعوا معلومات الترجمة الموجودة على الشات. I'm Lam Amir, I'm the Chief Operations Officer at Build Palestine, the organizer of this summit. We're very thrilled to have you all with us, speakers and attendees. Um, I have been working in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Palestine for almost four years now, although that's not a long time. However, I have lived with social entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs. I have witnessed all their inspirations, but also their challenges. Uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Palestine is considered new. And the social innovation ecosystem is even more recent. Only a few organizations in Palestine work to support social entrepreneurs. But we have seen many organizations lately starting their programs to specifically address the issues and challenges for social entrepreneurs in Palestine. And this is exactly why it's important to talk about this right now with some experts from Palestine and some other places in the world. This, a this panel aims to answer questions like, what do we mean when we say social innovation? What are, are the strongest ecosystem, ecosystems to support social entrepreneurs around the world? And um, sorry, and how have communities supported change makers to translate their dreams into impactful actions? This is why I have these amazing speakers today with me, who I personally consider as role models. Starting with Mrs. Lana Abu Hijle, who is a social entrepreneur, an accomplished development expert with over 34 years' experience working with international development agencies in Palestine and a strong Palestinian woman who paved her way to enter the Palestinian private sector. And also, Alberto Maziati Zanini, I hope I got the name right, the, right. <laughs> uh, the very charismatic Italian guy I've met in Ramallah last year <laughs> in one of the capacity building workshops with, for the MEDA project. And he, I personally benefited a lot from his experience and he helped us in Belt Palestine to create many of the running programs you see today. He is one of the creators of Impact Hub Network, and it's a leading global organization supporting social entrepreneurs and innovators who want to start up and scale their impactful ventures. And last but not least, uh, Ustaz Adnan Dewi from Morocco, Maghreb, who I met in Brussels last year, and it was very inspired uh, with his very critical uh, points uh, about supporting social entrepreneurs in the Arab world. He is the chief visionary officer and co-founder for the Moroccan Center for Innovation and Social Entrepreneurship, and he's also an Ashoka fellow. I'm really thrilled to have these speakers with me today. I just want to uh, tell the uh, audience, if you have any questions, please drop them in the chat. So hopefully we can address them at the end of this panel. And please share with us, how do you radically imagine Palestine by hashtag I imagine Palestine in the chat, Twitter, Facebook, whatever you want. And here I can kick off this panel. Our issue, hello all, Lana, Adnan, and Alberto. Hi. Ahlan, Ahlan Lana. I'll start with my first question about how do you define social innovation and how you think this term has evolved over time. And allow me to start with Mrs. Lana. Ah, the gender and age work together now. <laughs> <laughs> Assuming I'm the eldest amongst this group. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much, Lama. So glad to be with uh, these distinguished panelists with us. And of course, joining Build Palestine on this amazing summit. And if you want to talk about social innovation, I think we really first need to talk about Build Palestine. When uh, I remember Bissan Abu four or five years ago, came to meet me 
and she had a dream. Uh, she wanted to engage in a process to find a novel solution to a social issue she identified at the time. And uh, the idea she was describing to me was new, was clearly well get, provide a solution to a social problem that is effective, that is efficient, and that is actually just and hopefully sustainable, and we are seeing the sustainability now. And I think uh, this is the first part when you define a so uh, social innovation. The second important part, when Bisan talked to me, she was not talking about coming up with a, with a solution that would impact an is a personal issue. She really wanted to uh, impact the entire community and probably the globe. And that's, for me, real social innovation. That's how I would define it. Somebody who is willing, or a group, willing to dream, identifies the issue, comes up with a new, really innovative solution, and impacts the community that he or she lives in, and at some point, scale it to impact the world. Thank you so much. Amazing. Amazing. Just the correct definition. Uh, Adnan. How do you define social innovation? I think the, the times where we live today with the COVID is the perfect example to explain what social innovation is. That the old ways are not always the good ways. And it's and how I personally define it is basically the glasses. So how are you looking at whatever you have and what is the, the mindset that you need to get to shift the problems and look for solutions that work for everyone and, and I'm, I'm very grateful to participate in this event i've been as you know lena for the last couple of months working a lot uh, extensively on palestine to work with station j in jerusalem on how really to create a, a uh, systems that are enabling anyone to create and develop projects and i think that what we need to understand is that it's not just a buzzword because i hope that the people that are watching us understand that it's not just a trend and it's a way of looking at the world. It's either you just think that there are just problems and you have just capitalism and money, and you have other ways to say that, well, number one, we don't have planet B. Number two, if we don't fix our problems, nobody else is going to do it. And number three, if we don't do it together, we're all thinking together. That's basically how, I, how I've been doing it for the last 10 years. Hope we're not all thinking. Going to <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. That's, that, that's the beauty of all of this, is because we're aligning to idea together and to connect to be able to create and design solutions that would work for everyone, for the many, not just for the few. Social uh, innovation is open source. Yeah. Roberto, what do you think? So I think that I come from the sort of like old part of the world that uh, has started implementing policies on social innovation in the United Kingdom, in London in particular. This word started springing in 2007 when Jeff Mulgan at the time, uh, chief, executive, chief executive of the Young Foundation, published a white book on social innovation. And since then, we have seen a plethora of initiatives in Europe and beyond that fall under this label of social innovation. And here is where I become a bit more cynical because all the promise of social innovation, and I remember the promise in 2007 because I am, I think, a little bit older than you, Lana. Um, I remember the promises and the promises have not been fulfilled. We are not living in this wonderful world, sustainable, socially equitable, etc. Actually, the world is kind of worse than it was before. So at the World Social Innovation, I think initially it was def we defined it very much as these kind of like new ideas, new products, new services that come to markets and how they address social and environmental issues. Now I think we are looking deeper and we have to look deeper at the relationship, the methods, the underpinning bias and how we actually deconstruct those elements within the process of innovation itself to address social and environmental issues. So there's a kind of like a second wave that I think is going to be more painful in many ways because it requires to really change all of us, um, but actually more useful. Yeah, but I, I really always say this, that I think a word after Corona is a way much better than the, the one before. So thank you for your sure. insights. And I, I will stay with you, Alberto, to ask you about the main components of a healthy social innovation ecosystem, in your opinion? So, uh, you know, when, when we, I work for the Impact Hub Network, and we have this large network. 
And in many cases, we have been pioneers of these very terms in certain countries. We have been the first ones who opened a space where people were talking about these terms, social innovation and social entrepreneurship. And I make the distinction because these are two distinct worlds that overlap in many cases, like a, like a Venn diagram. And a healthy ecosystem, I think, is defined, first of all, by what local needs are. And this has to be the first element. There's no cookie cut up and cut and paste element you can bring around. But if we look at some work that we've done, for example, and there's a publication that I'm gonna to send to you um, that you can maybe distribute in the kind of library, for establishing elements of shared value with all the actors, for example, in a city, the, the city municipality, um, the, the, the local governments, but also the, the public, the sorry, private sector, the third sector and the NGO sector, all together collaborating within a framework that also challenges what they're doing. Well, this is the beginning of a healthy ecosystem because an ecosystem is not something that is static. It's an evolving system. And it actually lives in a chaotic state. I think the word chaotic here is quite criti cri critical because it's chaos and order together. We have to change things in order for them to become innovative. And this is not always easy, of course. Lama, I want to comment here. And I, and I also uh, link this with the statement you said, social innovation is a, as if it's a new trend. I kind of disagree. I mean, as a Palestinian, I've always lived with uh, highly innovative social ideas around, grew up with them, I heard my grandmother uh, talk about uh, that. Now I can probably put a fancy word too. But from the days uh, of uh, al in, in Palestine, the Takaful, uh, you know, the solidarity movement at a certain era, uh, going into the 70s, uh, the time I grew up uh, with, when, uh, a lot of focus was on the significant political and social lack of service issues that we faced, and oh, these whole groups. Uh, and individuals who engage in voluntary work coming up with community initiatives to basically contribute to the steadfastness, to the resilience of the Palestinian people, going into the first uprising and how individuals and groups came together to deal with the issues of you know, the collapse of the education system and the health system and all those service provision initiatives that came from individuals and groups during the occupation period. I mean, that tells you during history, uh, every, every time you discover amazing social innovations, but now probably you can give them fancy names. And uh, at, during each era, the context is different. How individuals interact, how organizations enable, how the governance structure work, the entire ecosystem that Alberto referred to is kind of shapes and forms the level of impact such social innovations can have and our abilities to scale them. And also the individual liberty, that freedom to dream, I think in different political and historic contexts, you see them evolving. So in a way, I don't see it at all as a new uh, let's say concept or term or phenomena, but now you know with the donors and giving fancy names and the scholars analyzing the knowledge about it, the ability to learn from it is actually much bigger than before. Can I, can I also let me comment on the yeah. the whole idea of is it failing its purpose? And I think I've I've yeah. had the chance over the years to uh, to experience different types of environments. Uh, whether it's, I don't know, it's Sudan, it's Iran, it's Palestine, it's uh, the U.S. It, it, it's very, it, it's very, very different because, and I totally agree with what Lena was saying on, there are some things that people are doing that they're not giving them some names because names do evolve. But the thing is that in many parts of the world, uh, uh, like I personally ask myself now these days a lot is like, what am I doing? Is it relevant? Is it useful? And, and since the start of COVID, everybody is talking about how will the world be post-COVID? Uh, will we have a more just world? Like, you know, the idea of the, the, the promises. I've done like around 100 conferences during the lockdown period. And every single one of these conferences, I said, what now the world is opening up at large is what we, those who were in this sector for decades, were saying before. Because the falling of the educational system is not new. 
the following of the healthcare system is not new. So now COVID is, is an equalizer because it showed those who were not, I would say, who didn't care much about what you need a public healthcare system, that it's actually important for everyone. And we add mm -hmm. the, the ideas of and the importance of climate change and equality. And here it's and why for me it's we need to de differentiate between social innovation and social entrepreneurship, where the whole idea of the I would say the business mindset in it and the idea of sustainability. Because in some contexts, it's actually pretty easy to be and have sustainable businesses. Like I've I've supported like over the last I'd say seven years, like 500 projects, MVP beyond. Mm. Very few, and I'm more talking about North Africa. Like I can tell that 90% of them have all failed. They mm -hmm. have not failed because the ideas were not smart or because the, the, mm -hmm. the people were not resilient. They failed mostly because the connection between the right, in, uh, um, I would say, elements in the ecosystem, whether you talk about uh, scaling, because even these terms don't exist in all languages. Like I live in a francophone world, the word scale doesn't exist. It's not in the sure. So when you talk about, like, like because the ideal world for social innovation is that you have some crazy people, you the idea, these ideas, and then somehow it's being, being taken forward by someone, whether it's uh, local government or it's uh, regional government or whatever. And there is a link between working democracies and social innovation. In working democracies, you have more chances that social innovation scale. And not working democracies, it's actually there is a very, I would say, causation effect in, in this. So to sum up the question on has the promise of social innovation failed, I think this is not fair because it's not a, a it's a, it's a mindset. It's not a promise. It's not a plan. And that's the difference between like do you want to wake up every day to fix problems and you have thousands of people that are doing it every day like and, and, and like providing alternative solutions to energy and so on so what we need to understand is that these words don't mean everything everywhere and mm -hmm. we need appropriate systems to be able to deliver on these solutions and to fulfill this promise i wanted to, to sort of like make a point that i am not an english speaker natively i am an italian <laughs> who also learned English, uh, although my accent, he has been polished in the United Kingdom for many years. And you are right, language is power, as we know very well, uh, McLuhan onwards, and language shapes the way our brain understands certain concepts. But I think mm. it's, it's a little bit dangerous to suggest that everyone can be a social innovator today. It's not true. And, you know, a lot of people are getting by with ingenious solutions to immense problems, like the ones that Palestine faces. That doesn't make them necessarily the innovators. And so I think that's the same thing can be said about entrepreneurship. When we talk about the ecosystems around them, there are certain levels of maturity that the ecosystem has to reach and in certain time frames that not, not everyone can actually achieve right away. And there's a sort of sense now, almost like a race between nations to try and build these ecosystems as quickly as possible. But that's not going to happen so quickly, partially because these ecosystems are based on a very, very intangible fundamental currency trust if you don't trust each other to be able to do yeah. these transactions this is not going to happen um so that's one point that i wanted to make the second point that i would like to add on the ecosystems themselves is you mentioned scaling before i don't know apart from us this is kind of like weird uh, to think about it like the impact up network is the largest scaled social enterprise and social innovation in its own right in the world because we have now 100 centers worldwide we touch 59 countries but not many other social enterprises that you can recognize as brands or as, as an entity are there. But what we have scaled as social innovations are movements, are other types of ideas. So those, yes. yes. And we don't, often we don't equate them because there is, especially in the Anglo-Saxon world, a tendency to push social innovation into the social enterprise camp and say, yes, it's the same thing. But it's not the same thing. Absolutely not. I, I think now, if I may just comment and then we can move Lama. Are you, you having connection problems? Go 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 <laughs> I think at first, people now are confused, you know, between what social innovation is, what social entrepreneurship is, what uh, entrepreneurs are, and kind of 
getting mixed in, in people's brains, you know, a social entrepreneur uh, or a social enterprise. And, and for me, innovation, the social innovations that can become movements and have significant impact and scale, at least for myself, that's where I find myself attracted. I don't know what would you comment on that? Because the, the, the line that's layering today. Would anyone like way. to... I think you're, you're right in a sense. I, I think there is also elements within those movements of transformation of social relations that has to happen, you know, and also transformation of power dynamics. Because if we don't, we can have a movement that goes around the world. Like, remember the, I mean, you know, the Arab Spring was a massive movement. And then it kind of like sizzled, but it didn't die. It transformed. And I think that's the energy that you see in a lot of social entrepreneurs and social innovators, or whatever you want to call them today, um, across the Arab world has been channeled through that because this is a way to change things, things which is less, let's say, challenging if you want. Yeah. yeah. And I, I want to take this conversation to the Palestinian context. Lana is a Palestinian. Adnan and Alberto both have worked with ecosystem builders in Palestine. And maybe I can take it to Lana to tell us about, you know, like, what are the strengths, but the weaknesses as well for the social innovation ecosystem in Palestine today? Yeah. Well, I think the strength comes uh, of the social innovation, let's say, ecosystem historically came from need. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a survival issue. It's not just, you know, now we have all these fancy names of resilience, but we lived under occupation for so many years where we lacked the governance structures, the, the political enabling environment. I mean, living under occupation, the lack of services I, I referred to. So we were not just forced to innovate. It was a matter of survival. So uh, the ideas I, I referred to, when we talked about the voluntary campaigns and the groups that were formed in the 70s, that was not because it was a trendy thing, because our municipalities were not enabled at the time to assume their roles. So the community mobilized, organized, came up with different ideas in the health sector, in the agriculture sector, in the environmental sphere, in the education, in the art, because also our identity was threatened our national and individual identity was threatened. So we always came up with these ideas, not just to preserve, but to develop and to remain on the I mean, local and global stage. I, I recall when I came back from school in the mid eighties and I first joined, I studied in the US and I first joined El Funun dance troupe, popular dance troupe. And you know, this is not just your, your regular popular dance troupe, it's a troupe that was created basically to preserve our his, historic, national, cultural, artistic identity and that we rally around it and we ensure that we remain as a people and as individuals. So I, I would see Al Funun, which is still now the best group in the Arab world, <laughs> I see it as an amazing innovation of the time, started by a group of five, and now we had thousands and thousands of Palestinian youth and senior citizens who are still in the group. But somehow, for me, I've always seen it as an amazing social innovation. Take us now to the last 20 years, post-Oslo, okay? In the Palestinian context, need was a big strength. Freedom, you know, our thought for freedom and hence, maintaining the freedom of mind, you know, the freedom to dream, despite all the prisons we live in. I think that's a huge strength for the Palestinian ecosystem. Post Oslo, I would say to a certain extent, personally, I worried of a major, I had a major concern. When you start establishing the foundations of the state, the government structure, and you had a very rich social innovation, basically let us, ecosystem basically led by civil society and by individuals and informal groups and hence the formal groups, the government comes and believes that they can deal with the complex issues, whether political, social, environmental, on their own. And really think that they can jump into this sphere and take the lead and leave everybody behind. 
that was a period of weakness for me. But I think what happened is, uh, in our ecosystem, there was immediate, not immediate, but individuals who recognized that we have to deal with this weakness. If we are talking about uh, continuously developing and evolving our ability to respond to the social needs and the political threats that we were facing, we need to allow social innovative ideas led by individuals, groups, civil societies to work with the government in partnership that you mentioned, Alberto. And I think the second strength with Mr. Hashem Shawa talked about in the previous panel is when the private sector came and recognized that we need to move out of this philanthropy approach that we all grew up with and so on into becoming a partner in the innovation, specifically social innovation uh, ecosystem, and hence the tribal. The weakness I still is, uh, think still on, on the government side, recognizing the potential available and uh, within the civil society, individual innovators, and the private sector, and the need to work in tandem. So, Still, our, our ecosystem is not evolving, it's continuously evolving. It has restrictions, but I think out of need to set fast, to maintain our national identity, to fill social gaps yeah. and so on. The innovations, the impact is, is known, not fully yet recognized, at least by the government, and the partnerships are forming. And I can talk in a bit about an example of yeah, that. Yeah, I'm really happy to see the private sector stepping in right now in Palestine. And I want to take the, the weaknesses about the governance and organization between the different uh, actors in the ecosystem uh, and go to Alberto, since you have been to Palestine, you have met many organizations in Palestine who are working to build this ecosystem. What do you think we should focus on right now, either for organizations or even for the social innovators themselves? So there, there's, um, there's a, a very common human tendency to always compare ourselves to others to build our identity. It's, it's, it's a very natural psychological process. So in order to be able to build this ecosystem, you are going to have to look at other ecosystems and think, what works here and what doesn't yeah. work here. It's very important though to, then, to do that process in a self-reflective manner, not just to copy. And so I was really struck by the radical imagination theme of your conference. And sort of going back to the very first question, social innovation in Palestine and this ecosystem that support it should be driving radical imagination. Maybe this is the, the mm. particular angle that Palestine takes. It's not going to be the angle for Jordan. It's not going to be the angle for Turkey. It's not going to be the angle True. You're muted for some reason. Uh, ultimately, I think uh, each one has to choose their own pathway within a framework that is agreed so that we can start comparing. And con because that's, uh, the, you know, when we talk about data, you know, data, um, yeah. the impact measurement data to start understanding, okay, well, we have two ventures here and they're both claiming that they're changing the world, but which one is really changing the world? These are questions that have been applied to the NGO sector and rightly so but increasingly will have to be applied to the social innovation, social enterprise sector. It's not enough just to say, I've got a brilliant idea. You know, you have to actually execute it, monitor it and measure it. Now, from that point of view, I think there's going to be a standardization and a pull towards standardization, standardization globally, but each local context has to be able to drive it uh, locally. And to the question of like, how do we apply certain models that are external to a context like uh, Palestine? True Palestine is, really unique, I have to say, of all the places that I visited in the world, um, they are truly unique. However, let me say that I also found in Palestine the same things that I found in Naples, the same things that I find in London. Like, there are, at the end of the day, we are people, you know, and we re replicate certain models within our communities that are very similar to each other. So, yes, different, yes, similar. And I think if I had a penny, because I started Impact Up Milan in 2008, 2009, so it was a uh, very early stage in the network when we had about eight or nine operating hubs and now there's a hundred no and eight, eight or nine we went to italy and i was living in the uk at the time and i said i want to open this thing this center that promotes social entrepreneurship and social innovation they looked at me and they were like oh, this is not england this is italy you understand no it cannot work here you're crazy you know and then i did it another seven hubs in italy and then 
we went to Africa. And the Africans are like, oh, no, 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 no. This is not, we're not in Europe. We are Africa. Come on. It's always like this. Huh? Everyone thinks that everyone else can do it, but we can't. No, no, because it's just us. No, we can. Everyone can. Yeah. Thank you so much, Alberto. Adnan, what do you have to say about this? First of all, I agree 100%. I think I think the the comments that Alberto just made the exceptionalism. You know, I I do a lot of work with government and public policy, and you name it. And everybody wants to think that they're unique and that this is just oh this is not going to work elsewhere. But again, where I agree with Alberto is that the focus should be different. And I believe that actually what Palestine needs is to up and foremost just be radical. So there is no option of, there's no option B. Uh, and from what I've been working like the, in this past six months a lot with the Palestinian ecosystem, I understood that even that, we don't talk about the same thing because Gaza is not Ramallah, is not uh, Jerusalem. So, but the, the common thread is by pushing the radical agenda to provide radical solutions with the radical resources, and then you can create a breakthrough. Uh, so I've been talking to a lot of young people, uh, especially from Jerusalem, and 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 because like, they're so tired of the situation because it's so complex. Everybody's like, uh, Jerusalem is so expensive, we can't do anything. You know these kind of very valid arguments, and because mm -hmm. they've been pushed into this, the idea of let's try something else is not there. So I think that and 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 and, and I've did I've done a project in in, in Iraq in Mosul. And my point, and it, it was the post-ISIS area, and you can definitely think that it's a very complex situation. Yeah. So, so the, the, I was working with an incubator there in Mosul, uh, and I told him that you guys' focus should be on doing things different, not rebuild, but transform. Yeah. So, so I think that this whole idea of radical innovation is what's lacking because you need to build the infrastructure, you need to build the links and you need to build the trust. And the whole idea of trust is I've had a, a mentor a few years ago who used to say that trust is the only currency that you cannot trade. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. so the challenge is how will you, you be able to build something? And here, when I say build, you know, like at different stages, because I, and, and, we met, and I mentioned the word scale and Alberto used it again. Scale and here is not just scaling up. You can also scale mm. deep, which means it's not about having hundreds of thousands of people. It's about having five people who have enough bold and crazy ideas that are going to move the shakers and movers. So, so what's important is to have the inspiration that understand that, yes, everything is possible, that everything can be, but it doesn't mean that everyone should be. But you yeah. can have mm. so For years where I was working with universities and people like, should everyone become an entrepreneur? I was like, no, not everybody should become an entrepreneur, but everyone should have an entrepreneurial mindset, which is the exactly. mindset of problem solving. And I yeah. think that yeah. this radical imagination that we need, the ideation for the future, because the political sphere is not delivering results and people need to eat. So if you don't deliver them what to eat, you know, things are going to collapse. And the last comment is, and, and, I, and I believe that, that the, the whole idea of the fear of missing out. So a lot of people don't dare to do things because they fear of missing out something. And in any context of Palestine, I think this fear of missing out should be fueled more. The fear of not missing out. Yep. Means on let's create things that, and here we're not talking about the KPIs and the metrics and the NGOs and so on, but things that go into deliver concrete results. Because concrete results talk to you. That's the that's yeah. show on that. Absolutely. And, and going back to actually Lana's point that this is not new to us as Palestinians. We have many checkpoints and we always find our way around or we jump on it. So we will we'll find our ways and we have to build our own ecosystem that fits for us. Um, to moving back to the last piece of this conversation and also thank you for my speakers who are already answering the questions in the chat. Uh, tell us about inspiring models or inspiring stories from your own ecosystem that we can be we can benefit from in Palestine and I will go to Alberto then Adnan then to Lana because I think Lana herself can tell us about her own story with the many social innovations that she has done and scaled successfully to Ukraine so I'll go with uh, Alberto first and then Adnan and then Lana 
So at the cost of uh, sounding ma uh, marketeer and self-referential, I will have to speak about the impact of network as the <laughs> reference because I am one of the, they, they called me, for a long time they called me the di one of the dinosaurs, you know, and then they started calling me one of the fossils of the network. You know, I, I don't even have actually a life form anymore. I have the, been confined to the world of minerals, um, but I have been with the network for so long. This is quite scary. What I noticed is, as a social innovation in itself, it started off as a very simple idea. There were four guys in London, and they thought, where do we go if we have ideas to make the world a better place? Where do we go to find people to collaborate with, people who can give us money, people who can give us advice? Where do we go? And that where do we go became the first hub. And the first hub became a model that started being replicated, copied, etc., etc., and then started being contextualized. Now, at 100, I can guarantee you that it's a very different beast to what it was when we were five or six. And yet it's a still a relational beast. So one of the things that I think is really valuable about social innovation is the relational dimension that mask has to be maintained. And one of the risks I think in COVID is that there is an acceleration rather than a, in a reduction of these relations. Because now we can, as you said before, you went to hundreds of conferences during the lockdown. Well, how much are these actually valuable trusting relations that we can build on? That's one of the risks that I think is very innate in technology. And I'm a complete technophobe. I said it from the start, so I don't take my word for it. But I think this is something to be looked at into. The second element is, well, COVID actually took from under our feet the rug because most of our income as businesses came from the spaces and suddenly the spaces were all closed. 70% of the income of our network was wiped out. And we're still here. How did that happen? Resilience. Because the resilience that is built into real social innovations is the one that allows you to pivot, that allows you to change. Because you are facing the unknown, but you are entrepreneurial, as you rightly said, all of us are entrepreneurs, all of us have started businesses. And so we understand that you've got to do it, you've got to do it. So that's the two powerful pieces that I would like to bring to the table. Thank you so much, Adnan. Tell us about Morocco or even other model that you've worked with. I, 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 again, I agree with what Roberto says because, and you know, and add some, I would say, um, uh, pepper in it because, of course, contexts differ, and of course, sometimes, you know, what when we think that we see the end of the tunnel, it's actually another tunnel. It's not even a tunnel. So, so like an, like something that can something that can work. So I kind of specialized in starting things from with zero. That's kind of my, my thing. So I don't like I don't like to work with big projects. What I'd like to work with is people who have nothing and want to do stuff. Like I give you an example of one of the projects that inspired me the most. I've been working with it the last I'd say four or five years. They, so they started by saying that there is a problem of of access of healthcare. People in rural areas don't have access to healthcare. Uh, because of lack of infrastructure, because there's no doctor and so on. But they started by saying, okay, so let's do an online thing. And this was Alberto before the COVID. So it was like five years, six years ago. And But then there was no regulation because in some countries, and I think this is where the opportunity of Palestine is, there is no, this, there is the gray lines. So when you have gray lines, it means there's no opportunity. In some countries, hmm. you don't have gray lines. You have black, which means you can't. So these guys, they were all medical students, and they found out that the regulation did not permit them to do the project. And then they said, okay, we want to improve the livelihoods of the citizens who access healthcare. Where do citizens who have access to healthcare go to? They go to hospitals. Who runs hospitals? It's students in most countries. It's interns, it's residents. And then they say, okay, so these students and residents, they lack skills. They lack experience. So they decided to shift their focus, the whole idea of pivoting. So from pivoting to the end user, which was the beneficiary, the end user became the doctors themselves and the medical students. So they've launched a very transformative, empowering program called uh, Step Out, where basically they work with medical students to develop medical and non-medical skills, like empathy teaching doctors and medical students how to do empathy. Because if you train young doctors, when they become full-fledged doctors, they'll be able to empower more. That's, a, that, that, that's an example that anybody can launch. Another one in schools, that's a program that I've launched myself uh, eight, eight, eight years ago, that starts with the premise that most educational systems in the world are broken. But when we talk about education systems, at the end of the day, it's teachers and students. 
it's not the policy, the government, the reform, the, the, the whatever. Mm -hmm. So with a couple of people, we decided to actually address these two people, the teacher and the student. And we said, okay, so when you have a problem, what do you do? Some people complain and some people fix. What we decided to do is to go to high schools, target 14, 15 year olds and tell them, if you find a problem in your school, go fix it yourself. And not just the students, but to the teachers. Why? Because kids, they, once they finish school, they go. But teachers are the ones who are not empowered, mostly poorly paid and so on. So we designed the systemic, and I think the word that we haven't used yet in this conversation is of the systemic thinking. Because the major difference between social innovation and the rest of is system thinking. So we designed a program where we basically work with students, teachers, parents, school administrations, uh, um, NGOs, and so on. All of them, they have to do one thing. Find one problem in your school and go fix it yourself. And with this, we've, we've discovered that through this approach, parents now trust more their kids because we mm -hmm. have to go back to kids. So now we have parents who, because in most in the Arab world, parents decide for their children what they do. In this yeah. case, we realized that actually because both of them been through this empowerment process. Now parents tell their kids, do whatever you want. We trust you. And <laughs> now you wow. become societal change. So, wow. so, so the idea is that needs, and Lana said it a million times, it's all about needs. It's understanding the actual needs and designing things that are fixing the problem. And then if it doesn't work one way, you can just pivot. And I give yeah. another, one of the most inspiring projects I know is Dialogue in the Dark. I assume that I better know. 30 that. seconds. <laughs> yes. So Dialogue in the Dark is one of the biggest social enterprises in the world uh, that was launched by Andreas Heineken. This year with COVID, they had to stop. Oh. He said, that's fine. We'll do something else. That's the idea. If it stops, do something else, pivot. <laughs> do something else. Thank you for the inspiring examples. Lana. Well, let me speak from experience. I mean, uh, always I find needs and I come up with all these ideas. But one of the critical needs I, I saw, I think, uh, almost 15 years ago, I, I'm a local governance specialist. That's what I do, help municipalities develop and so on. And we had the elections, first time elections. And of course, hopeful post uh, thinking that now, Finally, democracy, what is it going to produce? Of course, it produced the same old guard that did not have the skill sets, the values, understanding of good governance that I dreamt would, we would probably have the foundations for. That was the gap. That was the need. And, and a few of us, three or four of us sat around and were like, what are we going to do about it? Well, the most important thing is we prepare, help prepare the future leaders, the ones who have from now, to be engaged, to be allowed to contribute and so on. So we started forming in different communities in Palestine. We started in four communities, what we called youth local councils, general assemblies of young, uh, young Palestinians. We started with the age of 15 to 22 because we wanted them still to be in school. And taking the most important thing for us, I mean, the group who got together to start this uh, initiative at the time was that those youth do not understand that they have a lot of agents. Yeah. If they yeah. believe in it and they can practice it, they will carve their yeah. space in their communities. We, that's easy. I mean, you can provide people with skills, with capacities and so on, but that specific issue that they believe in their own agents, yeah. that's important value is what we focus on. So we formed these youth councils, initially in four communities. They started identifying the social issues, the economic issues, their own communities, they're on the ground, they're grassroots, and innovating together how to solve them. Resources are near, but when you come together, revive your sense of good citizenry, volunteerism, and so on, and youth always surprise us with their innovative ideas and so on. Solutions were coming, were impactful, were new, fresh. And I think a very important thing for these youth who have always been sidelined, disfranchised, you know, never engaged, suddenly they're in a leading position in their own space, working with municipalities, having a seat around the table. So 
small uh, story in four communities. Eight years, you know, that's the boldness, that's the commitment, that's the craziness. We have it in 50 communities. And suddenly we have a movement of 50, 60,000 amazing young energetic youth and graduates, alumni, yeah. you know, coming out of the initiative into the market, the political sphere, running for office, you know, the, the, the job market, uh, other social innovations, specifically the young woman, imagine. Wow. So it did stop there. And, and, you know, I don't mean by scale here, taking it somewhere else, but it was important for us, the group who worked on this youth council initiative to show that Palestinian youth can have a good story and they can export it. You know, we don't have to always import ideas. We are generators of good ideas. Yeah. Because I run an international organization, I have access, I have a network. And uh, I'm a member of the Aspen Institute. I have a network of global leaders. Small phone call, the idea suddenly, and Palestinian youth are taking it to Honduras. Yep. Starting wow. youth councils in Honduras. People speaking Spanish with the Palestinian Arabic, it's hilarious, but it worked. <laughs> From Honduras yeah. to Ukraine. And now, you know, we have sustainability <laughs> because an initiative is a beautiful initiative you managed we spun it off into a, a wonderful organization which i chair now but hopefully i will retire soon and the <laughs> alumni will lead it uh, we call it shiam and shiam youth make the future and it stands for shabab yasna al mustaqbal yes. and i wanted the word shiam because shiam in arabic means good values. values yeah and i think it is an, a, a word you know a concept we cannot emphasize enough because i think that what the world is facing now is a disintegration yeah. of the value system where the unbelievable new values introduced by global powers and and people became a normal thing which is crazy <laughs> so if you have such youth yeah. with amazing yeah. great values and can take them from the local to the regional to the global context and at least individually maintain them. So here I am with another uh, amazing organization, <laughs> Shia. But I just wanted to touch in a minute, otherwise Hashem will uh, really be upset with me if I don't talk about the partnership. When you create a partnership between the private sector, you mentioned something I somehow, I'm a civil society person, that's what I've done all my life. I found myself in the sphere of the private sector. And why? Why I entered those boards and wanted a seat around the table. It's so important to build those bridges because then you unify. The values start flowing. Absolutely. Yeah. The agency starts flowing. The borders start being reduced and magic starts, you know, the dreams and magic starts. When we, uh, I got to meet Hashem Shawa, the chairman yeah. of Bank of Palestine, and me and my passion and my, of course, hands all over the place, we together were like, we have a dream. And the dream was to put together a group of innovators, private sector leaders, government leaders, civil society leaders, hence the Palestine for new beginning. The problem was Palestinian innovators do not have a supportive space yeah. in the tech field and in the social field. So we started as a group, the social, the celebration of innovation. Yeah. From the celebration of innovation, the Global Entrepreneurship Week, from the Global Entrepreneurship Week, Ibtikar Fund, wow. from Ibtikar, which is the investment fund, we are now in the Intersect Innovation Hub, all of that in 10 years. Absolutely. And 10 years is not a short time, but it's also not a very Same long time. time. But that's what I meant when you create those partnerships, when the dream is unified yeah. and the, the resources the private sector can bring, and it's not always about money. It is not about the money. Yeah. It's the business model they can introduce us. We have a lot, we can learn a lot from. So that road that we took together, I, I believe by itself is something I would love to dive into, yeah. not just myself, and hopefully scale to other spheres within the private sector, civil society, and the government has to catch up. Thank you so much, Lana. I know we took more time, but it was really important to share these successful models from Palestine. Because I see a lot of, I saw a lot of frustration in some of the comments, especially about the ecosystem in Palestine and systems and government and, and organizing. And I, and I can tell everyone that we have to take the lead as people, as social innovators. We have to take the lead. If not, if some, if who is responsible is not doing it, then 
It's our role to do it. And this is what we say always in Palestine. Thank you all my speakers. Thank you for everyone who attended our session today. Anyone who engaged in the comments, I wish I can stay speaking for hours and hours. <laughs> Maybe inshallah at, at some uh, other time. Thank you so much, Lana. Thank you so much, Adnan. Thank you so much, Alberto. And thank okay. you for all. See you in the next panel. Now we will stream a video about an example of a successful social enterprise in Palestine, Irish Solutions. I'll leave you to the video. Ciao. Thank you, Lama. Thank you, co-panelists. Outstanding, um, outstanding facilitation. Yes, yes. Lama. <laughs>